Hello and welcome to According to John. Today we're going to be in episode 9 of the Days of Noah with Martin Dahan. The chapter is Nations in Perplexity. Let's get to it. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 37. The surest, most certain event in all the world is the personal, literal second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of this age in fulfillment of the hundreds of prophecies in both the Old and the New Testaments. Just as surely as he came to earth the first time 1,900 years ago in the literal fulfillment of prophecy, just so surely he will come again. The same prophets who foretold his literal coming the first time also prophesied at the same time his literal personal second coming. The same infallible Holy Spirit who inspired these prophets to foretell his birth, death, and resurrection, and ascension also has promised that this same Jesus is coming back again. Since the same prophets inspired by the Holy Spirit spoke of his first and second comings long before he came the first time, all of these prophecies were still future. Since these prophets wrote centuries ago, part of their prophecies were fulfilled, while part of them still await fulfillment. The things they prophesied concerning his first coming are now history and were literally fulfilled. The portions concerning his second coming are still future. But when these men of God prophesied, both the first coming and the second were still future. If then we study the fulfillment of the prophecies of his first advent, we shall know how to interpret the ones relating to his second advent. How were the prophecies of his first coming fulfilled? No one is foolish enough to deny the literal fulfillment of all the prophecies of his first advent 1900 years ago. He came a literal man, born in literal fulfillment of the word, born of literal virgin, born of a literal baby, grew up a literal man, died on a literal cross, was buried in a literal tomb, arose literally and bodily from the grave, and ascended literally into a literal heaven where he is today the man in the glory. Yet, strange as it may seem, while we all admit the literalness of his first coming, which is history, men will deny that his second coming back the second time, just as he went away. If it does not mean that, what does it is history as literal. They reject the future promises as being equally literal and spiritualize them away, even though all were spoken at the same time. So we repeat, all the prophecies were future when they were first given, But such is the folly of man. If we do not believe his promises literally, then what can we believe? We refer again to the first promise sent back from heaven. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Acts 1.11 If there were no other passage in Scripture, it seems to us that anyone with an open mind could not possibly miss the message of these words. It says this same Jesus is coming again just as he went away. If it does not mean that, what does it mean? To all who believe that Jesus is coming again, the question legitimately arises, when will he come again? This is a perfectly natural question. It was the question his disciples asked just before he went to the cross. They said, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world or age? Matthew 24, 3. Jesus did not rebuke them for their inquisitiveness, but gave instead a long list of things which would indicate the nearness of the event. While the exact day and date remain a secret, and we are severely warned against setting dates, our Lord nevertheless answers his disciples by forewarning them concerning the signs of the times. He did not leave them in darkness. We have seen a number of these signs in Matthew 24 in response to the disciples' questions. While turning to the other gospel records, we have a repetition of the account of these signs of times with some additional details. Luke tells us that in the last days, certain disturbances in nature will herald his return. He says, And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Luke 21, 11. Without indulging in far-fetched and fantastic interpretations, I am sure we cannot fail to see these words fearful sights, a reference to the strange things which are happening in the heavens about us. Surely there are strange goings-ons in space today. We laughed at flying saucers a few years ago when it was suggested they might 
well be visitors from outer space, but today we are geared full speed ahead in a mammoth program of interplanetary travels ourselves with an ambitious program to conquer the farthest reaches of the universe. The president promises we will put a man on the moon before 1970. Man has unlocked the secret of the atom. He has sent artificial moons orbiting the earth and bouncing signals off the moon and back to the earth. We have sent men in orbit about the earth, launched a rocket to inspect the planet Venus. Men whirl in space at a speed of 18,000 miles per hour and the heavens are being filled with mechanical satellites and artificial stars. Surely these are fearful sights in the heavens. By the time you read these words, all the foregoing may seem like a page from medieval history. How far will man be permitted to go before God puts a stop to his wild imagination? We cannot tell, but Jesus said that these signs, fearful sights and signs in heavens, would herald his return. As it was in the days before the flood when man's imaginations toward evil knew no bounds, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Our Lord gives additional signs to further clinch his words and adds, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring. Luke twenty one twenty five. Three additional signs are mentioned here. Distress of the nations, perplexity of nations, and unprecedented storms. First notice the expression distress of nations. It is amazing that these words should be spoken almost 2,000 years ago and be literally present today. For millenniums, men have dreamed of golden age of peace, an age of prosperity and plenty without the ravages of war. Yet, in our own short generation, we have seen two world wars, the last one ending in an atomic blast killing 150,000 people in the flash of a second. The slogans of these wars were, ironically, the war to make the world safe for democracy, and the war to end all wars. What irony! Today the world is an armed camp with the threat of atomic destruction hanging over our heads. And yet, after millenniums of dreams of peace, the nations have never been in such distress as today. The United Nations have hailed as the solution to the problem of war, but today, instead of uniting the world for peace, we have a divided world. Two enemies determined to destroy each other. When will men learn there can be no peace without the return of the Prince of Peace? Then Luke adds, with perplexity. With perplexity, to be perplexed is to be at a loss for a solution to a problem. There is no better word in the English language to describe the state of mind of our diplomats, statesmen, and rulers and leaders. They are facing an insoluble dilemma. Endless discussions and conferences are being held in an effort to meet the 101 threats to our peace and security, but all to no avail. One suggests a solution, another that, but all of it leads only to increasing perplexity. Diplomats, envoys, representatives of the various governments are tacking back and forth across the seas and continents, meeting in endless conferences only to return the message, no progress. We repeat, therefore, we shall repeat and repeat. There can be no peace, there will be no peace on earth without the return of the Prince of Peace. All these things are indications of his coming, however, and while distressing and disturbing to unbelievers, these world conditions are a source of encouragement to the believer, for Jesus said, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Luke 21, 28. Before we conclude this chapter, we must again remind you and keep before you the fact all these signs refer to the return of Jesus personally to this earth to set up his kingdom of righteousness. This will occur at the close of the tribulation period, and it therefore cannot happen for at least seven more years. The next event before the tribulation is the translation, or the rapture of the church. At this time, Jesus will not come down to earth, but will stop in midair, and from there he will call home his redeemed. The resurrected dead saints and the changed living believers. This is the event described by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. 
Then will follow the time of tribulation, lasting seven years, to be ended by the personal return of Jesus to this earth with his bride. We must carefully distinguish, therefore, between the appearing of Christ for his church before the tribulation and the second coming of Christ with his glorified church, caught up seven years before, to this earth. This is the key to the proper understanding of future events. Unless you understand the difference between the imminent coming of Jesus in the air to catch away his church before the tribulation and his return to this earth seven years afterward with his church, you will remain in an impenetrable fog of confusion and perplexity concerning the scriptural revelation dealing with the return of Christ. We emphasize this distinction because we are convinced that no one can properly interpret Jesus' words concerning his coming again unless two events are kept clearly in mind. The any moment translation of the church, dead and living, into the air with Christ, and two, his public second coming to this earth at the close of the tribulation. Now the signs which Jesus gives in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are not signs of the rapture, but are signs of Jesus' second coming at the close of the tribulation. Someone has rightly said, The Lord has given no signs for the church or the rapture. All the signs about us are signs of the second coming to earth. Seven years after we have already been caught away to meet our Lord in the air, it is true that signs are for the nation of Israel, not for the church. But since the translation occurs before the second coming, and the signs of the second coming are already here, we can only surmise how near the rapture must be coming as it does before the tribulation. If all the signs indicate nearness of our Lord's coming after the tribulation, and we must be translated before, it only makes that blessed hope all the more imminent. Although we grant that all the signs are for Israel and refer to Jesus' return after the tribulation, it does not mean that we cannot interpret those signs. A sign along the road may not be for me at all, but I certainly can read it. I drive along the highway and I see a sign which reads, Turn here for the Boilermaker's Picnic. Now, I am not a Boilermaker and I am not going to their picnic, but this does not prevent me from reading the sign and knowing where and when the Boilermakers are going to come together. So, too, with the signs of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. Although you may insist that these signs are primarily for the tribulation, that they will climax only after the church is raptured, and that they point only to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, I do thank God that I can still read these signs and know how near we are to that day. There is therefore no excuse for anyone to be ignorant of the meaning of these signs of the times. May God help us to be on the alert and to be like the wise householder who will not be taken by surprise by the thief. In the light of all this revelation of the word of God and the events which today are pointing to the soon return of our precious Savior, how solemn we would be, and how we ought to make the most of every opportunity to witness for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Certainly the Lord could not have made his word any plainer than he has. In these chapters we have pointed out a large number of signs given by Jesus himself, by which we might know how late it is on God's clock. There are many other indications beside these which are mentioned in the word of God, and one of the most profitable exercises for the child of God is to search the scriptures to see how near the coming of the Lord truly must be. We cannot take these things lightly. We must take them seriously. One of these days, we as Christians will have to meet the Savior who gave his all for us that we might have eternal life, and we shall have to give an accounting to him not only of how we have lived, but also how we have used the opportunities and talents entrusted to our care. May the Lord grant us to heed the words of scripture. Seeing then that all these things be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye be in a holy conversation and godliness? Second Peter 3.11 May the Lord grant us that when he shall come, whether it be at noon or night, we may not be ashamed at his appearing, but may have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of light and of his eternal peace. Well, I hope that that helped you. I hope that you have learned more. I really enjoy Martin DeHaan. He makes it so clear, puts it out there. And I pray that you are taking this serious, that you understand that we are in the days of Noah as we watch things unfold and we watch the politics unfold and the worlds collide and all that's going on. And I pray that you find it within yourself to share the gospel with the lost if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And again, if you don't, I pray the day comes that you receive Christ as your Savior before it's too late. 
Well, hey, I hope that this has helped you. And if it has, please like, share, subscribe, and follow. And until next week, God bless.